All right, let's go ahead and turn to massive fallout over Israel striking three times that uh, humanitarian aid convoy of um, you know international aid workers trying to feed starving Gazans. We've got the reaction now from the Biden White House. Let's put this up on the screen. Um, here is from Politico. They say Biden's not changing the Israel policy after a deadly strike on aid workers. Some of the senior officials think that is a blatantly and horrific and stupid mistake. Um, the tweet that they sent out of this article, the headline they put with it was, quote, angry Biden not changing Israel policy, which really kind of sums everything up. He pretends like he's mad. Maybe he really is mad. I don't know. But what does it matter if you're not going to change the policy at all? Because that's the message that Israel gets, like, oh, we just killed seven aid workers for Jose Andres, who's this famous, you know, worldwide known liberal chef who's very close with many people in the Biden administration. And even that we can get away with. And there's zero change in terms of policy. Um, you know, this comes at a time where there's just a report that uh, officials from the U.S. Agency for International Development warned that the enclave was now already experiencing famine. They say the level of hunger is unprecedented in modern history. So now you have all of these aid organizations that have suspended work in the Gaza Strip because they cannot keep their workers safe. So huge consequences for you know this territory that is now where people are starving to death. Um, and you have some quotes here from within the administration. You say, they, they say in the article, President Joe Biden was privately enraged by the deadly strike and in a public statement upbraided Israel for calling for accountability to those responsible, demanding more humanitarian assistance be allowed into Gaza. But two senior administration officials say that that is as far as he and the White House will go for now. They go on to say this has caused some fissures within the administration. It's just rinse and repeat with the Israelis. The American political system can't or won't draw a real line with them. And that is regrettable, regrettable according to a senior U.S. official. So, Sagar, same old, same old from Joe Biden. Oh, he's upset. He's angry. He's going to have a difficult conversation with Bibi Netanyahu. But that's it. No actual change to policy, which is the only thing that matters. Yeah, the entire thing is actually insane because uh, what we are watching is the even previous Israel supporters, people like Richard Haas, like Morning Joe, mm -hmm. all these other people, even they are sounding off. I will say, I mean, personally, just like annoyed at the idea that these people, look, these aid workers, I have nothing against them, but for some reason they're held up as like more human than everybody else who has died. I think that's and an important we, we point. We will get to that, and we will get to that, but I yeah. think it's that is just the point to me where I'm like, okay guys, like, you know, all human beings are equal, and I don't know why a Thai level democratic donor, liberal darling staff is enough to ignite an international well, you do crisis. Know why. You no, do, no, no, you I, do know I, why. I do know why. Because but, they, yeah. and and this, actually, yeah. can you guys put up which uh, number is this in this block? Nine, one. it's the very yeah. last, uh, this 12. Yeah. Put up the 12th element here, because this is from this Aaron David Miller interview in The New Yorker um, with Isaac Chotner, who's famous for these sort of like tough interviews. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit more than what is up here on the screen, because this gets to exactly your point, Sagar. Mm -hmm. 200 aid workers had already been murdered before these seven individuals, right. not to mention tens of thousands of Gazans. So why is there a different reaction here? Why wasn't this upset and concern, you know, the moment that there were so many innocent civilians being killed. Okay, so um, before we get to this quote, they say, you're, Chotner says, you're saying you have no investment in one analysis or another. I could be wrong, but when I was listening to you talk, and this is Aaron David Miller, who's this former uh, State Department official and, you know, wise by Beltway, foreign affairs, morning Joe type of guy, um, and you discuss the horrors of October 7th, I sense an emotion in your voice that I haven't heard at any other time in this conversation. I don't want to criticize that, but I do wonder if the people who make policy in America don't have that same emotion when it comes to Palestinian lives, do you think that's fair? Aaron David Miller says, I think it's fair to say, yes, that American Americans have a pro-Israeli sensibility. I don't think there's any question about that. Clinton wrote in his memoir, he loved Yitzhak Rabin as he loved no man, rarely loved any other man, which is extraordinary. I watched Clinton grieve in the wake of Rabin's murder, and when Biden gave the speech on October 10th, you watched the tears well up in his eyes. He talked about the black hole of loss. He's conflated the tragedies in his own personal 
personal life with what Israelis felt on that day. And then we come to this quote. Yes, that's very moving, Chotner says, but there is another kind of loss going on now, which he apparently can't conflate with his own experience, to which Aaron David Miller replies, oh, if you're asking me, do I think that Joe Biden has the same depth of feeling and empathy for the Palestinians of Gaza as he does for the Israelis? No, he doesn't, nor does he convey it. I don't think there is any doubt about that. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, it's true. For Joe Biden, the Israelis are human. He relates to them. Mm -hmm. He sees his own life in them. Palestinians, they're not. There's no, I mean, there's no other conclusion you can come to. So it took having aid workers, including an American, who are affiliated with an organization run by a man that he knows, who's an actual human being to him, it took them being killed before he really seems to have any sense of the humanity and the loss that's being experienced here. So I actually think that's a very key point, Sagar, because listen, I'm glad to see that there is upset about these individuals being killed, but you do have to ask yourself, you know, where was this upset so much earlier on? Well, you see children starving to death. That doesn't, you know, elicit your sympathy. That doesn't hit in the same way. It's it's, but this is this is what it comes down to. I really think those comments are so revealing and so accurate as to the dynamic that's going on here. Oh, I totally agree. Absolutely. Um, but as you were mentioning, Biden has lost all kinds of resistance liberals at this point with regards to his Israel policy. Mm -hmm. And perhaps most emblematic of that was a segment on Morning Joe with Elise Jordan, who is a former Condoleezza Rice staffer and worked at the NSC and she went off with regards to Biden's lack of policy reaction to the killing of these aid workers. Let's take a listen to that. This has been bubbling up from behind the scenes for a while. President Biden, frankly, is furious at Prime Minister Netanyahu. But yet still his administration has not conditioned sale, weapons sales, conditioned aid. They haven't done it yet. Now, maybe this is the moment that comes. This also happens just, we think, a week or two, perhaps, before this Rafa offensive, which really could be a flashpoint. OK, I'm so sick of hearing how upset President Biden is. The buck stops with him. If he wants to stop arms sales, if he wants to stop the bombs that are indiscriminately killing civilians, he can. He has the power. We don't need him going and his aides going to reporters and talking all back around about how upset they are. What happened yesterday is still going to happen. When, at Mika's conference, the, uh, the head of the Palestinian Red Crescent spoke, and she was incredibly moving. This was in Abu Dhabi. And she spoke about the difficulty of aid getting in the country period, from the north or south. And she described a process that was kind of like the TSA changing the rules every single day, going through airport security. Until those checkpoints are working and aid is going through, we don't need to be giving any more arms sale or money. It needs to stop. It needs to be conditional. It's ridiculous that it's going on unchecked and unfettered, and we're sitting around and talking how upset we are while we hemorrhage billions of dollars. It's the worst of all worlds right now for the president. Uh, the, the criticism looks increasingly empty. So there you go. Uh, morning Joe. Yeah, very nice. Reportedly, Joe Biden's favorite morning show program turning on him. And I mean, Elise Jordan, quite aggressive there, saying mm -hmm. no more military aid. This is ridiculous. I'm sick of hearing about how upset they are. Um, they need to actually do something. So that was quite striking. We also had uh, Barack Ravid, who is a reporter from Axios, who's actually been, I think, one of the favored reporters of the administration in terms of the information that they've given yeah, him right. throughout this conflict. He also previously served in the IDF. So again, not some big lefty out there, um, but with some pretty striking comments made actually multiple appearances on CNN. But this was with Anderson Cooper. Take a listen to what he had to say about the approach of the Israelis. It is clear to everybody that what happened with this strike was a serious violation of the IDF protocols and rules of engagement. OK, to call it a misidentification or a mistake, you know, that's the understatement of the century. OK, and this is not an isolated incident. The reason that we talk about it here is because it's WCK. It's a very well-known and famous NGO. But those incidents happen every few days in Gaza. There is a disconnect between how the IDF senior brass is looking at, at this and, and how it develops the rules of engagement and the orders, and ha what happens when those percolate down 
to the forces in Gaza, especially to the field commanders, the lieutenant colonels, the colonels, the brigade commanders, the battalion commanders. They're not in the same place as the senior command. That's both, the but do you say they're not in the same place, both literally, they're, they're in Gaza, they're not in headquarters, and they're also the ones fighting and they have a different attitude about, let's just get I, this done. I think they're inter- they, each commander on the ground has a different interpretation of the orders, and this is why you see what you see. That, and and that's this a is not for disaster. This is a recipe for a disaster, not only in Gaza, but for the um, uh, destruction of a professional military. Okay, this is not how a professional military conducts its operations. Three Israeli hostages that managed to escape their captors were killed by Israeli soldiers who, who fired at them even though they were uh, holding a, a white flag, okay? And, you know, I spoke to um, uh, an Israeli reserve officer who was in the same unit of those soldiers who shot those hostages. And I remember him telling me that the orders are basically from the commanders on the ground. It's just shoot every man in fighting age. Shoot every Oof. man in fighting age. He also, I mean, he makes a number of comments there yeah. that are quite striking. He says to call this a mistake or a misidentification, an understatement of the century, he says this is not an isolated incident. We're paying attention now, as Sagra's pointing out, because of who Jose Andreas is. Mm-hmm. And so it's stoked this international outrage, but he points out this is happening in Gaza all the time. And also dovetails Sagar with reporting from Haaretz recently about how the uh, Israeli military has basically identified these quote-unquote kill zones where anyone who enters these areas, they just assume as a militant and they kill them and they stack them up on their count of supposed militants killed. So when they say, oh, we've killed 9,000 Hamas terrorists, that includes any military age man that happened to get in their way or anyone who happened to wander into these kill zones, they count them as terrorists. So really important comments there from Barack Ravid. And again, the fact that even someone like him who really has tried to be you know, a neutral reporter mm. and who has had a direct line to the administration in many instances, that he's saying these sorts of things is pretty extraordinary. Of course, and he has more insight really than any of us. He does some of the best reporting, just like pure info, both from the Israeli side and the the White House side. He's got like a direct line to the NSC seemingly. Uh, mm-hmm. Just uh, last night, Jose Andres actually spoke about this incident and accused his uh, the Israeli government of directly actually targeting his workers. Here's what he had to say. What I know is that we were targeted deliberately, nonstop, until everybody was dead in this convoy. This happened over more than 1.5, 1.8 kilometers. So this was not just uh, bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or or no. This was over 1.5, 1.8 kilometers with a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top, in the roof. That cannot be the role of uh, an army. That cannot be the role of an army that has hundreds of drones above Gaza in any single moment. The humanitarians and civilians should never be paying the consequences of war. This is a basic principle of humanity. At the, at the time, this looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. Very extraordinary comments there for mm-hmm. him to, uh, to say something like that on top of the op-ed that he was written, um, Crystal. But it look, I, I do think this will be a, a change in U.S. policy or will be a big change, but... We have just to return to, look, we've been covering this stuff day in and day out. And it's like, if this, it's really, this is what it takes. I mean, look, at a certain point, I do, of course, care that an American citizen here was killed. But it's like all of this, the patterns that people have been able to observe now for almost six months. Yeah, it's like April 4th. So we're coming up on the six month anniversary of October 7th. It's been present for several, several months, you know, for a lot of people. But, yeah. you know, if anything, you know, if that's what it takes to break it, so be it. Well, and what Jose Andres is speaking there too is really the obvious and ultimately unavoidable conclusion that they were directly and intentionally targeted. When you look at the facts, three cars, three separate drone strikes, the cars clearly marked, the cars in a deconfliction zone, the cars having coordinated directly with the IDF, we're leaving our warehouse now where our food is stored. We are traveling up this road. 
And still, they are hit not once, not twice, but three times. The first car that is struck, the other two cars stop and the survivors of that strike get into one of the other cars and continue down the road. Then they hit again. And once again, the third car stops and the remaining survivors move the third car and then they hit that third car. And you expect us to believe this was misidentification and complex circumstances. Anyone with half a brain can see that is total and complete bullshit. And by the way, the story that's coming out from the IDF, you know, as told to Haaretz and others, has already been changing. You know, originally there was a supposed uh, someone who was armed that was at the warehouse. Well, yeah, you're in a war zone. First right. of all, the fact that there's someone with a gun doesn't make them Hamas when you're trying to escort an aid convoy. Second of all, is it really justified for, that's your, your rules of engagement, is even if this was some Hamas person who was in this convoy at some point, that gives you license to murder everyone in this convoy? So that was disgusting and preposterous to start with. And now we're getting into like, oh, well, it, it was confusing and it was complex and it was a mistake and it was accident. And as Jose Andres here himself is saying, that just does not hold water whatsoever. Um, by the way, it's not just people like him or the folks on Morning Joe or Barack Ravid who are sounding notes like that. Put this up on the screen. There's a report that uh, from Al Jazeera that UK's Rishi Sunak, prime minister, has informed Netanyahu that the UK is now considering declaring that Israel has been violating international law. Um, so the UK getting way ahead of our administration in terms of actually acknowledging what is, uh, at this point, I think, undeniable reality based on the facts that we've all been witnessing now for months at this point. And I also don't want to lose sight of, you know, the American citizen who was killed here. And Biden previously said, you know, when American is, is mm. hurt or injured or killed, we will respond. Let's put this up on the screen. This is Jacob Flickinger. He was the U.S. Canadian citizen who was killed by the IDF while he's delivering food aid in Gaza. He was a retired master corporal, served 11 years in the Canadian Army, including a tour in Afghanistan. He was a father and he was the sole provider to a one-year-old baby boy. So, um, you know, a, a real loss to, to him, to that child, to, um, you know, his family, his loved ones, our hearts go out to them. And let me put this uh, next piece up on the screen because this speaks to the, the shifting stories that we've heard at this point from the IDF. The latest report from Haaretz, as explained here by a, a great journalist, Demi Reader, is that uh, the bombing of the convoy was not a communication mishap, but commanders and units in the field ignoring instructions and disobeying orders, not for the first time. One IDF intelligence source says, quote, the general staff know exactly why World Central Kitchen was bombed, because in the strip, everyone does whatever they like. It's unclear whether the commanders asked for more senior officers' permission to target the convoy as they were meant to be doing per standing orders. Same sources dismissed the line taken by the chief of staff, Hertzi Halevi, and defense minister Yoav Gallant, who suggested the bombing was the result of coordination issues. Quote, this has nothing to do with coordination. They can set up another 20 coordination hubs. But if someone doesn't put an end to how some forces in the Strip have been operating, we'll see this happen time and time again. And quote, um, one of the perplexing things perhaps here at Sagar is, you know, Israel has very aggressively, um, you know, sought to undermine the uh, UNRWA, which was the primary mm -hmm. aid organization on the ground. The U.S. has all, you know, completely gone along with that, by the way. And so, and they also have been trying to do a propaganda effort to deny what has been, you know, made clear by the photos and images coming out of the Gaza Strip and also by the analysis of aid organizations on the ground, that the people of Gaza are starving. They're starving to death, and it's because of Israeli policy. So interesting, they'd actually been using World Central Kitchen as like a propaganda point. So, look, we're working yeah. with that. We don't need UNRWA. We've got these guys. Look, they're feeding people, et cetera. And World uh, Central Kitchen was genuinely doing fantastic work and was important. They were not a replacement for UNRWA. Obviously, it is wildly inadequate for the amount of need. But that was part of what was so uh, wild about this targeting and this killing was the fact that the Israelis were actually propping them up as this like propaganda piece. So, you know, on the one hand, this report that, oh, well, it's just because of these like rogue units on the ground seems to be a bit of a blame shifting and ignoring the fact that, you know, you've had 200 aid workers killed and this clearly the Israelis certainly at the very least don't care. And you've had this targeting of the entire civilian population through the policy of siege. Un, you know, destroying civilian infrastructure, destroying the healthcare system, et cetera. But in the same respect, 
you know, it seems it's it's pretty wild that they went ahead and murdered the uh, aid workers with the organization that they have themselves been propping up as an yeah. as an alternative to no, UNRWA. crazy. And they have offered no alternative explanation as to why anything like that even happened. Final and important piece here. Let's put this up there on the screen. Haaretz actually issued an editorial saying that the war must end in Gaza now. They say the incident in which seven people were killed, among them various citizens were killed in Israeli attack, cannot end with a comprehensive and transparent investigation as was promised. What it happens and and that we will do everything that's so-called not to happen again. It is not sufficient. They say that the war, an end to the war is the only possible way to move forward. And I think that's where people like Barack Ravid and any others, you know, people who are supportive of Israel are seeing is they're like, hey, you know, our nation is not going to recover from something like this for a long time. You know, in terms of international legitimacy, it's basically scrambled the board in a way that very least has not happened since the 1970s. And it took a long time for Israel to climb its itself out of that. Obviously, a lot of stuff has changed. So I do think that the, those will be very significant. And definitely watching the UK, the European Union, new, uh, some news coming out that Spain and the EU intend to uh, officially recognize a Palestinian state sometime in the next few months. That too could actually significantly change things up and change relations with Israel as well. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.